But it's a great privilege, really, to give this inaugural lecture as part of uh, BSMS 10. I don't know if everybody here realises, but this is the 10th year of, of the medical school. Uh, and so, from my point of view, it's really a privilege to, to be here at this point in time. Now, in terms of the, the lecture itself, interwoven through it are going to be aspects of my own sort of personal progression and journey in science. And uh, during it, I'll make reference to a number of individuals who've made uh, um, a real impact and, I, and to whom I owe an enormous debt of gratitude um, in terms of my own uh, scientific development. Risk is a really difficult concept, I think, for most people to understand. And I think it's particularly difficult when, when it's related to individual risk as opposed to populations. I think for populations, we, things are pretty clear cut, actually, and, and I'll, I'll show you some evidence for that. But it becomes difficult when you try and advise individuals about risk. So as part of my lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about biomarkers, because biomarkers are used to determine risk, and you have heard of some of them. Cholesterol levels, for example, is a biomarker of risk. I'll introduce uh, some concepts uh, that are probably new to you. Free radicals, antioxidants, they all sound so esoteric, don't they? Heat shock proteins, uh, and try and relate it to my particular area of interest, which I've been studying really for uh, 25 to almost 30 years of my career. Um, and I will use um, cardiovascular disease as a paradigm for considering the use of biomarkers um, um, and in, in relation to coronary risk and provide you with a, a novel hypothesis, not entirely new. I, I wrote it some, some years ago, uh, trying to attempt to explain why there are inconsistencies in relation to cardiovascular disease. So first slide shows the inside of a coronary artery. That's if I can point using this. So what you can see here, this, this sort of yellow area here, represents the plaque. This area here represents a, a rupture within the plaque. And this dark area represents a clot, uh, which in this patient's case resulted in his death. So that the process is rather complicated. It re relies on decades of progression during which a plaque forms, the plaque ruptures, and then a clot forms. And all those are dependent on a number of risk factors that we can measure in blood. What is the impact of cardiovascular disease? This is from the BHF, and what, they, you know, what they've um, noted is that there are about 103,000 heart attacks a year. 152 strokes in the UK each year. Um, there are nearly 2.5, 2.3 million people living with coronary heart disease and nearly 1.2 million having had a stroke. And it costs the UK, both industry and the NHS, several billions of pounds each year on healthcare costs, treating coronary disease alone. But when you talk about cardiovascular disease, you're talking about stroke and peripheral vascular disease as well. So the difficulty is, who's going to win here? And I, 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 spare, I wouldn't say win. Who's going to get, develop heart disease? What are the odds of you as an individual developing heart disease? And you may be surprised to know that cardiovascular disease is the major cause of death. You can see here, this represents the greater portion of the total, uh, something like, something over a third of, patient, of individuals will die of heart disease and stroke. And you could say, OK, well, that, that's our UK problem, but actually when you look globally, it doesn't look very different. And that may surprise you. And the reason for this is, is that uh, cardiovascular disease is increasing in prevalence in uh, the emerging countries around the world, in particular India and China, where it is now the most common cause of heart disease. It's not infectious communicable diseases, it is cardiovascular disease which is causing the problem. I quite like this, this reminds me of Seattle. And the problem is you don't wear your risk on your chest. You, uh, the risk uh, is difficult to determine. Uh, and, uh, and I think what we'll try and talk to you about in the next few slides 
is the ways by which we try and do that, to try and understand what the risk is. One of the ways that doctors use this is from the uh, uh, British National Formulary. In the back of the formulary, doctors are probably quite familiar with this, and what this shows is the risk of de developing cardiovascular disease in the next 10 years. And I think it's important to recognise this. That's uh, the issue that we're looking at, trying to measure. It's within the next 10 years. And what you see here, these red bits represent high risk, greater than 20% risk. The green bit, obviously, is less than 10% risk. And that risk is calculated using these uh, nice, rather nice and simple diagrams. And what you can see are some of the risk factors associated with that risk. So, uh, first of all, not, this is in non-diabetic males. Um, if you've got diabetes, your risk is sub significantly high, and therefore it's not worth actually calculating what that risk is in absolute terms. You require treatment. But also whether you smoke or a non-smoker, how old you are, and what your blood pressure is. You can see along this axis the uh, systolic blood pressure. And what your... TC to HDL ratio, and what this is is total cholesterol HDL ratio. Total cholesterol, I think most people understand, is a risk factor. HDL cholesterol is another fraction of in, in the cholesterol that circulates in blood that is protective, and therefore that ratio between bad and good cholesterol is what we use in this particular calculator. If we talk about risk factors in isolation, so if we talk about uh, cholesterol as a risk factor, what we do know is that risk doubles as levels increase, but it's not in a linear way, it's in, a, in a, an exponential way. So what you can see here, this curve going up, the risk doubles between 5 and 6.5. If somebody has a cholesterol of 5, it's uh, half that of somebody who's got uh, a level of 6.5. Not quite as simple as that but we'll come back to that in a little while. And it quadruples with uh, between 5 and 7.8. So this uh, curvy linear shape relating risk of cardiovascular, or coronary heart disease and, and serum cholesterol levels. But why I say it's not as quite as simple as that is, is this figure. And there's a distribution. You can see the distribution of cholesterol here in a normal population without heart disease. And this is the distribution in the population with heart disease. And what you notice is that there is an area there where the patient with, high, uh, with, with heart disease has got relatively normal cholesterol levels. And that's a bit, a bit of a, a surprise, I suppose, for some people that around about 50% of heart attacks and 50% of patients with cardiovascular disease have normal levels of cholesterol in terms of how, how uh, normal, normality for cholesterol is defined, I'm not going to go into. But there's this very strong overlap between cholesterol in patients with and without heart disease. And part of the reason is this, that cardiovascular disease is multifactorial. There are a number of risk factors. Cholesterol or lipid profile is only one of them. There are others, I've mentioned some already, blood pressure, um, smoking, uh, metabolic status, whether you've got diabetes or not. Um, some others which are sort of relatively new to most people, socioeconomic status, and that may have an impact on a number of things, including nutrition, for example. Inflammation and infection, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that uh, later. Obesity, and of course, this may be linked with some of these other factors, so people who are obese also tend to have high blood pressure, also tend to have abnormalities of uh, inflammation and infection, also have abnormalities of lipid profile. And then another factor which I have not talked about, which are genetic factors, which I will talk about in a little while. Now, where do we get this data from? And I think this is, gives you some idea of where the problems lie in terms of the risk calculators that we've used. Most of this data come from a place in, near Boston in the United States called Framingham. Um, and they, in 1948, started a, pro, a, a research project, uh, which is called Framingham Heart Study, looking at a cohort of men and women, in this case about 5,000, 
who they followed up from 1948 over the next few decades. And what they did was to look at who died, who developed cardiovascular disease, and what the risk factors were. And they've started several other generational studies. So uh, there was an offspring study started in 72, and a third generation study started fairly recently. And it's this sort of data that have led us to uh, understand what the risk factors might be. Most of it is driven by age, and that's a problem, and I'll tell you why in a little while. Cholesterol and HDL cholesterol ratio, which I've mentioned, blood pressure, smoking status, gender, because of course, in general, in, in, our, in, in, in the UK population, males suffer cardiovascular disease more than women. That's not true in every country, as it happens. A measure of how hard the heart is working, so left ventricular hypertrophy, which can be measured using ECGs, to be technical, and, and type 2 diabetes. So that study identified all those risk factors as being important. And I'm not going to go through this, but that was the outcome from that study, looking at uh, the formula, is rather complex mathematics, relating those factors to uh, the risk of cardiovascular disease. Simpler, and I'll try and explain to you what this means here, we have a reference group here with different levels of blood pressure. And what's happening here, as, as we go down further and further, more and more risk factors are loaded on. So at the end, you've got an um, individual who is 60 years of age or greater with diabetes, who's male, who's got a low HDL, who's a smoker, who's got a high cholesterol and uh, a high blood pressure, of uh, systolic blood pressure of 180. And that individual, not surprisingly, has a pretty high risk of developing uh, heart disease in the next five years, as, as measured in this particular study. 44% risk of developing cardiovascular disease in the next five years. I just want to go back to that, actually. One of the issues that, that I have, and many other colleagues have as well, is this issue of age. Because in order to calculate the risk, and why am I interested in risk anyway, 10-year risk, why is it 10 years that you're looking at? And the reason is eco economics. So what we want to know is who's worth treating in that, over that 10-year period in order to recover the costs from, from having to treat patients. And the problem with it is that, that cardiovascular disease doesn't really fit very neatly into that little package. Cardiovascular disease occurs over decades, not just 10. And actually, if you treat patients early, they're more likely to benefit than if you wait until they've got heart disease and you treat them late. So in some senses, this gives you a false sense of, of righteousness, as it were. It, it would be better to treat more people early than waiting until they've got heart disease and treating them late. I want to introduce this concept of biomarker. I've said that cholesterol was a biomarker. What is a biomarker? Well, a biomarker is a measurable characteristic that reflects the severity and presence of some disease or, or physiological state. And in this case, I've mentioned two examples. One is a troponin, which is used um, uh, to, to detect, to diagnose a heart attack. Uh, a very specific marker for that. And the other is beta-HCG, which is used for determining whether a woman is pregnant or not. Again, highly specific. So, that's why, so there are many sort of uh, biomarkers that we use in medical practice, and, and many of them are extremely useful. I just want to introduce this. My, one of my hobbies is reading um, Sherlock Holmes novels. And um, I, I, the, you, may un, you may say, why have I introduced this at all? Well, actually, Conan Doyle um, was aware of biomarkers, and you may be surprised at that. It, you know, he's writing at the early, early 19th, uh, 1900s. Um, and uh, the reason I know this uh, is if you look at this little extract here, Sherlock Holmes, uh, he was a clinical pathologist, as it happens also. What he, what he said in his first meeting with Dr. Watson was, in, and this was in a chemical laboratory, in, the great, in a wing of a great hospital, it happens, to, you know, Bart's is where I come from, Bart's is where this happened or purportedly happened. His first comment was, I have found a reagent which is precipitated by haemoglobin and by nothing else. I mean, it's complete nonsense, doesn't mean anything, 
but what it introduces is this concept of specificity and a, and a marker for, for disease. I just want to try and um, introduce also a concept of utility of a biomarker. And for this, I'm, I'm using a, a, quite a trivial uh, example, and that is the distribution of heights in boys and girls. So if you've got girls there, boys there as a distribution in this rather strange class of 4A, um, and then, then if you decided to say um, how many of that, or if, if you wanted to predict the gender of a pupil who was greater than 1.35 metres tall, well, you can all tell me it has got to be a boy uh, because there are no girls with, with that sort of height. If you look at this distribution, on the other hand, where there's complete overlap, and I ask the same question, you would not be able to tell me whether it's a girl or a boy. And then this more sort of real-world example of, of distributions where boys at that particular age are likely to be slightly taller, there is an overlap, but if I were to ask you uh, uh, what, is, what is the gender of a, of a pupil who is greater than 1.35 metres tall, the likelihood is that individual would be a boy. And if I asked you what is the gender of a pupil who was less than 1.25 metres tall, the likelihood is that, that that would be a girl. Now, when we try and understand the use of that particular marker for gender, it, you, you end up with, a, uh, with trying to assess how good a test is. So in this particular case, in the first example I gave you, uh, where height was a very good predictor of, web, of gender, uh, we, we can measure this as an area under a receiver operating characteristic curve. Sorry to be complicated about it. These curves were originally used to test the abilities of radar operators during the war. And they were asked to determine whether a spot on a screen was an enemy aircraft or not. And in order to test them and to an an analyse that data, they use rock curves. That's why it's so called. Now, um, one of the things that I've mentioned previously is that this height um, issue in class 4A was very good discriminator. Um, under those circumstances, the area under the rock curve would be a 1. So this ranges between 0.5 and 1, and it's a very good test in that particular class. For the uh, second example I gave you, where there's complete overlap, it would be represented by this line, diagonal line here, where the chances of you being able to tell whether it's a girl or a boy is like tossing a coin. And, and the area under that curve is 0.5. And then in between, there are these two curves where there is an intermediate value to that particular test. So what you're trying to do is accumulate tests that allow you to fit a curve that's right in that corner over there in order to be able to discriminate between those who will and won't develop heart disease, in our case. This has been used for cancer uh, as well for, for quite a while. And what you see here is the ability of two tests, A and B, to determine whether somebody has colon colorectal cancer or not. And you can see by using both of them in combination, the area under the curve is somewhat greater. So by using those tests together, and you can say that B is better than A, and, and, and C, that is using both of them in combination, is better than either one on its own. So I'm going to show you a few curves like that to, to tell you about uh, risk factors for cardiovascular disease. The first is using cholesterol on its own, and the area under the curve is 0.63, and you can see <coughs> this corresponds to being pretty poor as a measure, as a, a discriminator. When you add in the Framingham risk score with the additional risk factors, that goes up somewhat to 0.74. But that still means that 26% of that population is miscategorised using that uh, uh, analysis. So it's not brilliant as a, as a way of determining risk. So in the UK, um, that there are a number of other um, risk scores that were used, and one of them that's used in many practices in the UK now is Q-risk. And as you can see, there's a comparison here between and males and females have different areas under rock uh, curve, but in both cases, the improvement was actually pretty small. So it goes up from 0.77 to 0.79 in, men, in women and 0.76 to 0.77 in, in men. This particular risk score includes 
Family his history and deprivation index. Things which I've already mentioned. The family history, of course, relates to genetics in part. Now, it seems that that couldn't possibly end up with anything important, but actually it does. What it does is allow you to uh, recategorize risk in patients. And I think this is a really important issue here. So using that Q risk as opposed to Framingham, around about 53 to 54,000 patients were reallocated to a different risk. So high to low or low to high. Now, from an individual patient's point of view, being categorised as high risk when previously I was low has a, a great impact on me because I will be treated. It also has an impact on society and, and, and the NHS in terms of cost because what you're doing is better targeting treatment to those who need it and away from those who don't. So I think it's an important concept to understand why are we bothering with this? Well, the idea is to try and reduce costs and improve efficiency of spend. So, um, even so, that they, they felt that there was a need to improve things even more, and uh, the Q-Risk score was introduced fairly recently, and that introduces uh, three new uh, uh, additional uh, parameters. The presence of rheumatoid arthritis, which I think many people didn't realise was a, a really a high-risk uh, uh, association with cardiovascular disease, renal disease, which we knew about for a very long time, and atrial fibrillation, which causes a risk of of stroke. And using that approach, and uh, the, the, again, the, there was a slight improvement, but actually it's not brilliant. It's still 18 to 20 percent of individuals are not in the right category. So if you look at it in a slightly different way, so this is a whole, and I'm just looking at females on this case, a whole female population, that is what Framingham identified as, as individuals at risk, that is what Q-Risk identified as individuals at risk, and these are the individuals who actually developed cardiovascular disease. Now, what this means is that we miss out on this group of individuals and include in the, in the algorithm those individuals who are not identified. And the, the slight problem, of course, is that we're looking at 10-year horizons. And what this does not tell you is what happens at year 11, year 12, year 13, and so on, when additional people will actually develop cardiovascular disease. So this is the slight problem that we have, is in trying to interpret this. They're at high risk, they're, they're identified at high risk, they haven't developed cardiovascular disease yet, but they're still at high risk and may develop it in the, in the near future. I like this quote. Um, this is uh, from uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, and it says, uh, as, I, as you can read, it has said the director, and he was in um, Hatching Centre, I think it, it was called, Hatching Centre in London, when he said this. Hasn't it occurred to you that epsilon embryo must have an epsilon environment as well as an epsilon hereditary? And of course that's right, and you know, um, we mustn't forget about uh, genetic factors, um, and we know, for example, that 50% that of cholesterol is determined by genes. Heart disease overall, depending on the population you look at, is between 15 and 50%. It depends which population you're looking at as to what value you get there. So one of the things that we, I did, the first paper I wrote, actually, was in relation to trying to uh, determine what the genetic factors for having a myocardial infarction were. And I worked with my um, dear colleague, David Galton, in his lab at Bart's, looking at a particular gene called the protein C2, uh, C3A1 gene. And uh, you can see just a diagram of it down here. As it happens, these two genes are very close to each other on, on, on chromosome 11. And the analysis involves cutting this gene into tiny little pieces using very specific molecular scissors called uh, restriction enzymes. And in the majority of people, you will end up with a fragment that's that long and a fragment that's that long, and you can separate them out on a gel, and this is what you get, this sort of fragment, the two, two pretty large fragments. In some individuals, there's a variation. So you get the same length here, but a shorter fragment here, due to the fact there's um, been created in the base sequence, the nucleotide sequence, a, a variation called po uh, polymorphism, which results in a, an additional cutting site at this point here, and you end up with a short fragment. 
So these individuals, this individual here and this individual here, are heterozygous for that particular variant, and this individual here, quite unusual for that rare allele, for that rare variation in which that cutting site exists. And if you then look at the frequency of that particular polymorphism in patients with myocardial, uh, myocardial infarction, those without, uh, you can see that the frequency is much greater of that variance in, in the post-myocardial infarction group. And as it happens, in a recent uh, genome-wide association study, they identified precisely that locus uh, that was associated with risk of the many that they looked at. And, you know, this was total luck. You know, my, my colleague and I thought, and actually the, the gene probe, that radioactive probe that was used in this study, was available. You know, we were attuned to that, but that was the first, one of the first uh, gene probes for uh, an apoprotein gene that, that existed. We were just very lucky. But it seems to have panned out in, in terms of larger studies now. Now, you could say that, you know, why can't you combine then gene analysis with, uh, with uh, the uh, Framingham score and get something better? And actually, this was done. So what was done here? Uh, there are something like 18 polymorphisms looked at. You can do things much easier these days than, than when I was studying in 1985. And they were, they've screened um, uh, thousands of, of patients and looking at, in this case, 18 different gene variants. And what, you, what they did was then follow these patients up for a number of years and then looked at see, to see how many patients actually died over that period. And as the numbers of those polymorphisms increased, the numbers of patients who died over that 12-year interval increased too. And you can see that here on this diagram. But then when you try and match that up, and the, what this shows is the rock curve with or without that polymorphism data included. And... Really, there's no difference between those two uh, uh, tests of, uh, wait, uh, means of testing. I'll try and come back to that later. I'll leave that question hanging. One of the other things that we know very well is that inflammation appears to be very important. You may have heard on the news recently that there is a way of imaging coronary arteries that could predict cardiovascular events, that is a heart attack. Inflammation seems to be very important. The reason it's important, I explained right at the beginning, that it causes rupture of the plaque, and the plaque ruptures and then becomes clotted out because of the, the fact that it presents to the blood a very thrombogenic sort of surface, and the patient then dies. So what is the difference then between a plaque that will rupture and one won't? Well, one of the things that differs is in relation to the amount of infl inflammatory cells the other is how big this lipid core is compared to one which is stable. And the third is how thick is this overlying muscle layer compared uh, to, to one that doesn't rupture. So there are three characteristics that we know about. You can measure inflammation systemically in blood using a particular biomarker called C-reactive protein. And what has been shown is that as the level of C-reactive protein increases, then your risk of myocardial infarction also increases. And this was shown irrespective of whether somebody was on aspirin or not. Aspirin is an anti-inflammatory. And you can see it's still there, that association is still there, but it's attenuated to a major degree. Did that improve the marker, uh, the, the ability to, to predict? Well, a little bit. So when that was added to the Framingham, you can see that, that there was a slight increase in terms of um, in terms of assessing how, how good that test was. That doesn't mean to say that inflammation isn't important. It might simply mean that that marker isn't a particularly good one or the fact that you're trying to look at a local inflammatory process by measuring something in the blood, and for that reason, it doesn't work. Where does inflammation come from? It comes from infective agents. So within the plaque, and it's been demonstrated, I'll show you in a minute, a minute that, that there are microorganisms within plaque. Now, the question is whether they're etiological or in, in any way involved or just innocent bystanders. Uh, there is trauma uh, in terms of treating coronary disease. We use angioplasty, which is passing a balloon into, into the artery and, and expanding it. 
There's pi bypass surgery where the, the coronary artery affected is bypassed. There, is, there are free radicals, uh, toxins, oxidized low-density lipoprotein, which I mentioned in a minute. There's autoimmune responses. Heart transplant patients develop a, a, a very rapid uh, accelerated atherosclerosis. And finally, foreign bodies. And these include cholesterol crystals, which if you look at a section through um, a coronary artery, you can actually see these crystal clefts um, um, within the artery. So this is, first of all, this rather brown staining, this brown staining here, it shows a macrophage which is filled with chlamydia pneumoniae. Now, as I've said, the, the association uh, doesn't mean to say causation, and uh, it's been tested in part by using high-dose antibi uh, antibiotics in these patients who've got cardiovascular disease to see if anything happened, whether you could improve outcome. It didn't. And the reason possibly is that it's too late. There's no point uh, treating uh, with antibiotics when, uh, when actually the damage has already been done. This just shows how balloon uh, angioplasty is done and the deployment of a stent. This is a stent, this sort of wire mesh here. This is obviously the balloon. It's passed into the coronary artery or other arteries and blown up. And then the stent is put in place. And what you see here in the section <coughs> is these, these, this is the metal bits of the stent. This is where the artery wall was. So initially, this was in the, on the inside surface of the artery wall. And what you see here, all this thickness here is, uh, is what is called intima or neointima, where there's been proliferation of smooth muscle cells, and that recloses the artery. So the idea is for the balloon and the stent to keep the artery open, but what goes against that is the fact that there is proliferation of cells, and this may in part be driven by the inflammatory response. These little black dots here, which are so indistinct, represent a specific stain for macrophages as it happens. So macrophages are present within the artery wall, and these macrophages have been shown by my, um, my colleague um, Russell Ross to produce a growth factor called PDGF, PDGF platelet-derived growth factor. And when you inhibit that growth factor in models of, of um, angioplasty, you can inhibit the restenosis event that occurs. So this may provide a route to, to treatment and is indeed has been used in, in, in recent past. I thought that would be my introduction to free radicals. I thought it was really brilliant. Um, so what are they? Um, well, they're chemical species possessing unpaired electrons, highly reactive, and they're produced during normal metabolism. And uh, two examples of them are superoxide and the hydroxyl radical. And um, so this just shows that the, the, the way, so normal respiration leads to the production of water in 95% of cases. So 95% of molecules of oxygen are converted into water harmless, obviously. About 1 to 5% result in the formation of superoxide and hydrogen peroxide, and these can enter the cell and cause damage. If you do the calculations, which I won't ask you to do, you'll end up with about 5 grams a day, it's about a teaspoonful, of these noxious molecules. Uh, that doesn't sound a lot, but when you look at numbers of molecules, it perhaps gives you an idea of the potential for damage that, that may occur there. So it's, it's, it's 90 followed by 21 zeros uh, uh, per day. And these, uh, these can act on particular molecules like DNA, protein, and fats, like uh, 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 unsaturated fatty acids, for example. Uh, and so although they can do harm, they can also do good. And part of the reason why white cells work is that they produce the equivalent of bleach, hypochlorite, uh, using oxygen and using superoxide and hydrogen peroxide to, to lead to the production of bleach, which can then be used to kill organisms. But as, uh, in, in the same time, they can also cause damage to, uh, to cells and to other molecules. They cause lipid oxidation and uh, endothelial injury, that is the lining of the blood vessel wall is damaged uh, potentially by them. And I work with my colleague, uh, uh, Eric Angord, uh, in uh, Bart's, uh, looking at, uh, at the cellular conversion uh, and, uh, and production of 
uh, uh, of oxidized LDL, which is a molecule I, I described to you in a little while of why it's important. But we found that a particular sort of white cell can produce uh, this modification of LDL. So it causes damage to, uh, to, to DNA, causing strand breaks, base damage, uh, cross linkages and mutations, errors in, in translation, in prayer protein synthesis. It can cause damage to proteins such as apoprotein B, which is the main molecule, main protein present in, in low density lipoprotein, which is the major carrier of cholesterol to a form that is oxidized. And in that, the uh, apoprotein is fragmented, uh, apoprotein B is fragmented. It can alter enzyme activity, receptor interactions, uh, and certainly cause aggregation and fragmentation. And then finally, it could cause damage to unsaturated fatty acids. And this process is one that is propagated. So it continues uh, as, uh, uh, by the interaction, for example, of hydroxyl ion with unsaturated lipid. And that process continues uh, and uh, lipid peroxides are generated. Now, this pr process is <coughs> probably quite important in atherosclerosis. Briefly describe what's shown here. So LDL is this major carrier of cholesterol. It enters the artery wall, but doesn't accumulate in itself. It has to be modified in some way. And it's actually oxidized to oxidized LDL, which can then be taken up by white cells. And these white cells become rather angry, producing cytokines that damage other cells, including the endothelial cell. Just, just to show you that that's happening here, this is from a human section of, a, of an artery. And what you see here in red, first of all, these are cells which are stained with something which is against oxidized LDL. And this one here, this parallel section, is from a section where the cells are stained, that is, the macrophages are stained, and they co-localize. So what's happening is, is this, and some of this is beneficial and some of it's harmful. Oxidized lipids, reactive oxygen species, interact with cells, you get an expression uh, or, or, or translational, uh, of a trans, a transcriptional factor, NF-kappa B, which then goes into the cell and then stimulates a whole range of cellular processes, some of which are harmful and some of which are potentially beneficial. So pro-inflammatory response, cell adhesion, and then beneficial is the induction of antioxidants and heat shock proteins, which I'll mention in a little while. How, do these, how is this process inhibited, which there are some natural inhibitors um, and, and some which are present in the diet and some present within the body. So vitamin C and vitamin E, I'm sure you've all heard of, in the diet. Albumin and urates, these are produced endogenously. They're uh, uh, molecules which are produced by the, by the body itself and they have some antioxidant uh, effects. And then there are enzymes in the body which are produced, superoxide dismutase, catalase, and so on, which are also produced um, by the body and often induced by exposure to free radical, radical attack. <coughs> now, is an apple a day? Will an apple a day keep a doctor away? And this, is, uh, this phrase is, is shown up here as well, but I think this is the original for, for that. So, and in this case, and you'll make the doctor beg his bread. I'm not sure that, that, that will go down particularly well, but there we are. Um, so what is the evidence that, that, that antioxidants are of benefit? And this is a study from Finland in which they looked at dietary flavonoids, which is one form of antioxidants. It's present in high amounts in onions and apples. And these are two molecules that are flavonoids that are present in that food. So just for your knowledge, uh, any, any fruit uh, or vegetable which is really well coloured will generally contain quite a lot of antioxidants. This and other studies led to this view that you should have five a day. And uh, what you can see here is, is the relationship between numbers or portions of fruit and veg versus the risk of cardiovascular disease. And you can see that as, as you eat more, the, uh, the risk falls. And the, the, the sort of bottom end of that, the, the nadir of that, is sort of above five uh, fruit and vegetables a day. So you can get improvement, but you've got to really exceed that five a day message. 
And the other problem is that we don't know what sort of fruit and veg to have. And so uh, generally uh, advice is to have a mixture of different fruit and veg because we don't know which antioxidants are really having the beneficial effect. The other message is that fruit juice isn't enough and that you shouldn't count fruit juice as one of your, uh, more than one of your five a day. And the reason is that the fruit and veg contains other active ingredients, fibre, for example, that are probably quite important too. The other, I think, important issue is, is the interdependence of antioxidants. So what you see here is the effect. So this is vitamin E protecting you against superoxide and lipid peroxides. It is itself converted into this radical called a vitamin E radical. That itself is pretty potentially harmful. So what, what happens is that it's recycled back using vitamin C. It's that combination of vitamin E and vitamin C that are really beneficial. If one looks at the data supporting using antioxidant vitamins as biomarkers of risk, so this is vitamin A, C and E, and carotene were measured in this particular study. And what they looked at is the risk of, uh, of angina in this group. And you can see that um, at the, this top end, this is the highest intake versus the lowest intake. You can see certainly for vitamin E, there was this very strong relationship. Now that led to a whole plethora of intervention studies looking at the benefits of antioxidants. So I've listed here from a, from a meta-analysis which is a putting together a whole range of studies, uh, the outcome of that. And the, and the conclusion was, because what, what you're trying to do is see uh, these studies should extend over here uh, and actually there are, uh, yeah, sorry, over this, in this direction. So this favours supplements, that favours the control. You can see one or two studies, there is no overlap with that line. But in most cases, there is no overlap with the line. And in, actually, in summary, there was no benefit from supplements. I think it's an important message and, and one which was really quite difficult to understand. But in part, it's related to this issue of combined uh, different complexes of antioxidants which you need and another reason which I'll explain a, a little bit later. At that time there are whole loads of adverts you know that things like antioxidants may keep us alive longer, the right combination, this idea that perhaps you can combine smoking with taking antioxidant that will protect you. You know I think that this is the sort of story that you would see in, in, in the press and the media. If you look at smoking specifically this is what you saw Actually, if you took, this is the unity, so this is neutral effect, no effect. If you took these antioxidants, beta carotene or vitamin E in combination, it, your, your relative risk was actually higher, not lower. Uh, and that may be difficult to explain other than the fact that I've already told you that, that actually exposure to a little amount of free radicals causes the induction of protective factors. So that's one thing. The other is that they, that they may also have an effect on the function of cells, such as the macrophage. But in any case, I think the bottom line is, certainly antioxidants don't offset smoking, and certainly, probably, just used in isolation, single antioxidants are ineffective in terms of preventing cardiovascular disease. So there's this issue of optimum nutrition, and the problem is, where am I on this spectrum? Am I here? Am I here? And so if I take, um, if I take a, 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 an antioxidant, am I going to improve my position to the optimum value or am I going to actually make myself worse? And the problem is I don't know and you won't know and it's very difficult to assess where you are on that spectrum. I'm going to shift slightly. One of the other protective mechanisms are heat shock proteins. An oxidative stress, as I've said, causes aggregation and unfolding denaturation of, of, of protein. They are then broken down. That you end up with a non-functional cell and uh, aging, it results in aging or reduced lifespan. In the presence of the uh, heat shock proteins, these denatured proteins are refolded uh, and they, you end up with a normally functioning cell with a maximum lifespan. A slight problem is that in that process you get altered H, uh, heat shock protein as well. That is viewed as foreign by the body and you get an antibody response to it. And that is potentially harmful for a reason I'll explain later. <laughs>
I've just, this is a really pretty slide, but I'm not sure it's very easy to understand, but this basically is a coronary artery, and these brown areas here represent macrophages with expressing heat shock proteins. And what you have here is, is in, instead of, um, instead of uh, trying to double stain these, so these gre this green area represents macrophages, and, and the areas which are also sort of staining yellow are those areas which are um, heat shock protein rich. So what this says is that heat shock proteins are expressed in lesions, both in, in this case in the coronary artery, in this case in the aorta. And they seem to be in areas where macrophages are producing free radicals. And we measured then the, uh, the levels of heat shock protein in serum in patients who admitted with chest pain. And what you see here, this is the control group, and these are individuals with chest pain who admitted. Um, and this is a couple of few days later. So there seems to be an acute effect of releasing heat shock proteins. Heat shock proteins are present at very high concentrations in the myocardium. And what we're proposing is that the heat shock proteins are released during that acute event and then are cleared. And the reason they're cleared is that you develop antibodies which clear those, uh, that particular antigen. And we know that there are antibodies there because we've measured them as well. And you can see these are two, three groups, healthy controls, uh, individuals with chest pain with uh, troponin positive and troponin negative. So these patients here have had a heart attack and these patients here have not had a heart attack but have probably got atherosclerotic heart disease and therefore uh, they've probably been exposed to heat shock proteins in the past and developed antibodies to them. So not entirely normal, as it were. They just haven't had a heart attack on this occasion. So just trying to explain what's been going on here then. Free radicals from normal metabolism in the environment, damaged cells, that's prevented by antioxidants. That also, that's the free radicals, induce various genes uh, within the cell, including the production of intracellular antioxidants, which protect the cell in the inside. Um, they, it also induces chaperone molecules, such as heat shock protein, which prevent or reverse denaturation. Now, I'm just sort of trying to explain uh, my hypothesis and trying to bring together some of these really complex um, um, uh, themes that I've tried to raise with you. The multiple step hypothesis is quite clear. And what, what we're saying here is that there is a progression from, um, from normal artery to cardiovascular endpoint. And it's been proposed that in the past that you know, this is almost a seamless event, this is continuous uh, that risk factors that act here are likely to also act here or along that pathway. That's clearly not true. Um, the fact is we measure things like clotting factors in blood, but actually the, the point at which they're going to have most effect is probably at the end. Whether things like cholesterol have an effect at the beginning and the end and the middle, that's possibly the case. If you look at the biology, that's possibly the case. But what I'm saying is that risk factors act at different times, and yet we're measuring it at a single time point, which in some senses doesn't make any sense at all. You know, it doesn't help, and that's perhaps explaining why those rock curves that I described to you earlier were a problem. There's another reason why they're a problem as well, and that is my view, and there's quite good evidence for this, that you don't go down a single route. You don't need to go down that single route. There are alternative pathways... And the bundles of risk that transmit that uh, risk, that move you from one process to another, uh, may not contain any classical risk factors. So what you're doing here is moving along alternate pathways until you get to the end point. Um, and that perhaps explains why, if you measure one risk factor here in relation to this bundle, you might be missing them out here in a particular individual. So what I'm saying here is that it's not always possible to predict what the bundle of risk factors is and therefore what is the solution to that. Well, another approach is needed and I think what that approach is is to look at the physiology, look at the function of the artery wall early and we can do that using endothelium-dependent flow-mediated dilatation as one measure uh, and what you can do here is put a probe on the artery you uh, occlude, the, uh, occlude the arm with an inflatable cuff. You then measure the artery calibre, 
and a, a baseline, and then uh, once you've released the cuff. And what happens if that artery is healthy is that it will dilate. And the reason it dilates, it's producing a healthy uh, compound called nitric oxide, which acts on the artery wall and causes it to dilate. If that artery isn't healthy, it won't dilate as much. And then you use a sort of control uh, agent, GTN in this case, to measure uh, what it will do maximally. And if you use that approach, uh, uh, what you find is actually it's a pretty good measure of early uh, of predicting events, and you can use that approach uh, in even even in patients who um, who are quite late in the process. So what this shows here is the uh, analysis studying the evaluation of the association between coronary or peripheral endothelial function and cardiovascular events, and in both cases you can predict uh, quite well who will or won't develop heart disease or, or the cardiovascular event. You might need to use a different approach late, and that approach is looking at the pathology of the artery. And in that case, you look at things like calcification, for example. You can use x-rays to look at calcification within the artery wall. So this is a narrowing here. And in that narrowing, you also find co-localized uh, calcification. And if you use calcification, coronary calcification, as a way of, uh, with the Framingham risk score, what you can do is within those individuals at low risk or at high risk, you can stratify them better. So even within the group that had a, a, a notional risk of less than 5%, you can find individuals and groups in which the risk is up to 20%, 19 to 20%. And in those notionally with a very high risk, you can also find groups that have relatively low risk. So this is looking at the artery wall, rather impugning risk factors are going to help you. Uh, so, uh, and, and the other thing is to, to be able to better predict and manage the individuals in this grey area of do I treat them or do I not treat them, by using this approach, you might be able to determine that. So this is an area under the rock curve for coronary calcium score. And you can see, even on its own, this is the curve here, even on its own, that is better than Framingham. Not in every patient group that you look at, but certainly in this particular study and in several others. The problem with it is that it requires a high exposure of x-rays. And you don't want to be, able to be doing that to the general population, and you don't want to be doing it very often. So what we try to do here is try to develop... First of all, it uses up quite a big resource, because it's read by cardiologists, and we've got limited, limited numbers of them around. So, and it takes, it's time-consuming. So what we try to do is develop a, an automatic system, to, first of all, to read uh, the, the, uh, the CT images that were resulting... And the idea is to work on that further to, to see whether we can get a coronary calcium score automated using lower exposure of x-rays, which we did in this case. So that's where we're heading. And, of course, you would have heard on the news um, that, uh, as I've mentioned previously, uh, the you know, heart, risk, heart attack risk identified by new scan. And what you see is this patch uh, lit up. And the reason it's lit up is because there are lots of macro activated macrophages in that area. Uh, and that predicts the uh, unstable plant rupture. Uh, and so this is probably where the future lies. Now, I may sort of be a bit down on biomarkers, and I don't mean to be, because I don't mean that they are totally useless. Biomarkers are useless, useful because you need to be able to monitor changes in risk factor profile. Uh, but I think in terms of actually determining risk, they're not, not particularly good, as I think I've shown. So I'll conclude. This is my last slide, other than my slides for thanking colleagues. So risk engines such as the Framingham score and Q-Risk have facilitated the identification of individuals at high risk but do not adequately differentiate individuals at moderate risk. They, they do not provide adequate data on lifetime risk for young people, and those people are ignored and not treated, and I'm sure some of you may have been in that situation. Biomarkers of early disease and plant instability have therefore been sought, and I think now we're getting there in terms of identifying some of those markers. Although some of these markers have been shown individually to be associated with significant hazard, 
ratio, no substantial improvement in discrimination has been demonstrated when added to risk engines. And I think a more direct measure of disease burden using other modalities such as imaging may prove more useful. I've got to thank my colleagues past and present. Uh, I, as, as, as I've alluded to, I've worked in a number of um, uh, institutions. I think David Galton was, was my first mentor. Russell Ross, who sadly has died, uh, really introduced me to proper science, I've got to say. Uh, William Harvey and Eric Angord uh, and colleagues, other colleagues there, were brilliant uh, in terms of their enthusiasm for research. David De Bono is a cardiologist in, in Leicester, one of the most brilliant men I think I've known uh, and uh, increased my knowledge and, uh, of clinical cardiology, certainly. And my colleagues at uh, Surrey, who uh, contributed to much of the work I've shown you, and my PhD students. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, Thank you for listening. <laughs>